Welcome back guys to another video of Rapid Chats with Angus and today I have another special guest, probably the most high profile player I've ever had on my show so far. He is Sailosi Takitaki Bao, all the way from New Zealand born, but he played for Samoa and we will talk about all his career ups and downs and whatever is good. So Sailosi, welcome to my show. Cheers, thanks Angus, good to see you. Yeah, likewise man. Um, you've had an illustrious career, like I've mentioned, and you saw the world in your playing days. But it all started at Wesley College in Auckland, where so many great All Blacks were schooled. Did you perhaps dream of donning the famous black jersey, or was the dream always to present your native Samoa? Um, I'm not going to lie to you. You know, growing up in New Zealand, it's um, every kid's dream, especially if you start playing rugby early on, is to be an All Black. Uh, you know, All Black is... Uh, being an All Black is the pinnacle of uh, of all rugby players and um, in New Zealand, and that was something that I did want to, um, you know. But the way that things go when you're young, and there's there's so many good rugby players in New Zealand that you have to compete with, and and sooner or later you you have to make a decision on on um, on what you want to do, especially if you reach that level. Um, I was fortunate enough that I'm I'm a mixed race, so my my mother is Samoan and my dad's Fijian. So being born in New Zealand wasn't the only, only country that I could play for. Um, I did represent Fiji in the under 21s. I, that was my first time to South Africa. It was during that, um, I think it was 2001 Rugby World Cup for the under 20s, uh, under 21s at the time. Okay. Was in, was in South Africa. So I represented Fiji then. Um, and then eventually, I didn't really hear anything from them. And, and to play for Fiji as a winger, it's probably one of the hardest positions that you're going to compete with in the world. They had the likes of uh, Rupini Thao Thao on the wing and Cyril Bombo that are all very, very uh, high profile rugby players and very talented. So um, obviously I didn't, I didn't hear much from uh, the Fiji Rugby Union after that under 21s um, competition. So then I, I went to Samoa for a sevens competition, um, and then they realized that I had family there. Um, the wow. coach at the time was Romeo Archong, and he, he reached out and asked me if I, was, uh, if I was keen to play for Samoa at the next IRB sevens circuit, which was Hong Kong. So um, yeah, it pretty much all started from there. Okay, cool. So it kind of falls into my next question. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, your brother Michael actually played for Fiji, right? Yeah, I think they didn't want to let another Tangi Taki Mbawa escape. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they let one go. So you will spoil for choice your career long. You know, you had New Zealand, you had Fiji and Samoa. But um, yeah, I think you made the right choice at the end of the day. Because I think I'm a Springbok supporter. So I don't want to see you running down the wing on one of our smaller guys. So it's probably a good thing you didn't play for the All Blacks. <laughs> No. no, just kidding, man. But um, you played this rugby um, since 2003 before you played for any major provincial club sides. Would you elaborate on how that started? Because it's not very often where you see someone going into the test arena first and then play more provincial rugby afterwards. Yeah, well, Samoa at the time, they, they struggled for um, outside backs. Um, and they didn't really have many high-profile um, Wingers. Um, they had a few wingers at the time that were that were playing in the seventh circuit. A few local players um, that were in professionals as well, and and obviously a few club rugby players within New Zealand and Australia. The only high-profile player at the time was uh, a player called Lome Fatal. He had all the tattoos, the traditional tattoos down his legs. Played for the Hurricanes. Um, he was the highest-profile player. So for me, it was um, you know it was. An opportunity came. I proved myself on the seventh circuit, and um, you know, I think, as as most international countries, are always wanting a Fijian on the wing. I think, and uh, it's, it's a trend. I think the trend started around about that time. And, uh, myself and I think Jarrod Kapoka played for New Zealand, and there was a uh, you know Otto Takiri that was playing for Australia at the time. So there was a lot of Fijians on the wing, and I think Samoa fell into that trend um, more more so. So. Um, yeah, it was just an opportunity came. Um, I think I was sort of taken to to allow a little bit of depth going into that um, into that tournament and just to to cover. But um, there was a an injury early on, and uh, I got called up, and I eventually played um, awful awful tests. So 
yeah, it was, it was an awesome experience and I was very, very fortunate to have uh, that sort of start to my, to my international career. Uh, definitely, and it's probably true what you say. It's not a test team unless there is a Virginian winger. I mean, look at, at the Aussie backline now, so it's the same. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so everyone knows you as a wing and a center on occasion, um, but you actually started out as a flank in your formative years. How did that transition come about from being in the pack going to the back line? <laughs> Yeah, it was it was it was weird. Um, my my dad was a was a second rower. Um, he played club rugby in New Zealand, um, and he was a tall guy. You know, back then there there weren't many over two meters tall um, second rowers. So if you were falling into that six foot uh, tall um, category, then you were pretty much pushed into 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 the second row. So dad was dad was a second rower, um, and then I sort of. He only knew how to train his kids as a as a forward, so I had a little bit of pace at the time, and um, he put me into to play um, to play back row. And I think his one of his favourite players was Michael Jones, um, who played for the All Blacks. And uh, I think he he wanted me to you know it was it was it was a Polynesian that played for the All Blacks, and it was sort of an idol for for all of us upcoming youngsters that were playing rugby. So um, yeah, I just fell into to playing. Flanker, and I didn't change until I went to high school. So um, that was a weird, that was a weird thing because I, as as I think that stereotype of of being Fijian and ha- having pace and being on the <laughs> wing, um, I was I was being wasted at flanker, so they they pushed me out to the wing at, at high school. So that's how it all started, I guess. Yeah, and and you know what's funny, Dorsey, is that uh, Jonah Loma had a similar part. He also started in the pack. I think he was a number eight for the New Zealand juniors. And then later on, when we became an All Black, he actually went to the wings. So it's it's not uncommon actually, I think, for for the big guys to actually yeah. make that transition from being in the forwards and going to the backs after all, eh? Yeah, yeah. No, Jonah was Jonah was obviously he's an old boy from Wesley College as well. So he um he he had his own. He was just a massive human being at school, and um, you know it would have looked quite awkward that your biggest player was playing on the wing, uh, especially in those early. You know those those early '90s. So um, he was. Uh, they still they had to make a bed for him at school. That you know, uh, extend the bed. They put two beds together and, and, and made an extendable bed for him just because he was he was so tall. And he still holds, you know, shot put records, you know, athletics records uh, till this day. So amazing man. And you played provincial right before Taranaki, before joining the Chiefs in 2005. Who would become your first franchise in Super Rugby? But then, not long after that, you joined London Irish and then became a club legend, you can say, racking up 157 appearances and 57 tries in the process. And that's between 2005 and 2014. Um, what prompted you to leave probably one of the best competitions in, in, in the world at the time, you know, being Super Rugby and go to the Premiership? Yeah, so I spoke about it earlier. My, my old man, he... You know, he was a massive influence on my rugby career, um, as as all dads are and and, and young uh, men. So, dad was. We came up with a plan, um, and we set goals as a youngster. When I decided to make that um, decision to play for Samoa, um, we knew that that was going to stop other avenues for me to to be an All Black, for me to play for any other country, and I was committed to 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 that one country. Um, you know. I was never going to make a, a living or make make my worth in New Zealand after I played for played for Samoa because the, obviously the international rule comes in, you're capped to a certain um, you know wage bracket back then. So I couldn't really because I was ineligible un- for the All Blacks. Now they I was always on that rookie salary. So for me and Dad, we set goals that I wanted to play at the Hong Kong Sevens, and I ticked that box. And the next goal was to play in the 2003 World Cup. We took that box. And from the back of the 2003, we wanted to get a pro- pro- professional gig. So I, was, you know, I played my heart out not long after I, I made the Taranaki team. And then I made the Chiefs in that same year. Um, after the Chiefs, I pretty much went as high as I could in, in New Zealand. Um, and for me to make a living from it, I, I had to look elsewhere and look offshore to, to obviously provide and have a future. And... And and obviously try and test myself in a in a different arena. I've really done everything I could in New Zealand, and uh, I was still young, and I wanted to have a 
travel the world and it was a good chance for me to get over and, um, and earn some good money. And, you know, at the end of the day, I needed to provide and that was all, all that I knew. So uh, London Irish came along. I, I now work with um, the person that scouted me from, from all the way back then, it's many moons ago now, but um, Brian Smith, he was, he was my coach at London Irish. Um, he scouted me in the 2003 World Cup and he followed my career and he knew that um, I was looking for a club and he, he got me over. So it's now gone full circle and now I'm working for him here in, uh, in Australia um, at, a, at, a, at a boys' school. So. Oh, nice. Nice, <laughs> it's, nice. Uh, and exactly... Um, <laughs> Yeah, and exactly what are you doing for him now? Because um, you said to me that you are quite busy on Saturdays with the rugby now. Yeah, so I'm, I'm affiliated with the local club here. I run the under-20s program. Um, okay. It consists of three teams uh, called the Colts. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure they call the Colts program over there as well. So okay. all under-20s, we call it the Colts over here in Australia. Um, and we play in the Shoot Shield competition, which is the, the equivalent for the, you know, it's the biggest club rugby competition in Australia. So, um, yeah, I run that program within my club called the Wurringerats. Um, and then I, I do other work with uh, Scots College uh, during the week with um, my old coach, Brian Smith. So rugby rugby's still there. I'm still a part of it. And, um, you know, it's a, different, it's a different competition and uh, it quenches my competitive edge. Um, sometimes I'm wanting to put on the boots and I do put on the boots sometimes. <laughs> I think it was took of me coming out of retirement. So, um, <laughs> you know, it, you do get that itch, but I think uh, coaching um, helps me get by. <laughs> get your fix, eh? Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, and you also represented the Pacific Islanders, which is a very much a, a British and Irish Lions kind of setup, you know, because you have guys from uh, Fiji, Tonga, Samoa. And, um, you know, in terms of coming together as one, I mean, how is that experience for you to play with other island nations as well? Yeah, that, you know, that, that's an awesome initiative. It was, it was, it was good for us uh, as, as smaller nations to come together. And like you said, pretty much like a British and Irish Lions and tour together, you know, where our history goes long and to, you know, as enemies and, and for us to get together and, and represent our Pacific Pacific nations in one team, it's, you know, it's, it is a, you know, it's, it is an idea for, for an amazing rugby team. So unfortunately it's always pretty difficult um, with, as you would have heard with uh, Polynesian rugby and, and just, you know, the budgets and, and being able to fund, fund tours in that. It. It's pretty tough, but um, we always have sh- shuts, short windows of, um, of opportunity and, and, preparation leading into tests so it's always hard to to really compete to the highest level but we have a good crack at it and uh, we enjoy it and it's uh it is it is really good fun yeah i saw the results of those matches it wasn't bad at all i think the only team you came and stuck again was against ireland we took a bit of hammering but for the rest you were actually fine eh? yeah yeah they you know we put up a we are we are the warrior nations. We uh we love to we love the confrontation and we love the physical battle. So we'll always go hard. Um and then you know when we are together as as three different nations, it's it's good because we learn about each other. We rugby is such a small um, environment that you always you know you're always changing people in your team and you always come back and you play with someone one week. A few years later, you you join back up with them. So it's it is always really good like that. And um, for us to to come and, and be competitive in such a small space of time and preparation, it's um, it's difficult. But uh, as you may have um, noticed, us Polynesians are very easy going, and uh, you know it's any excuse to, to sing a song at the end of the game and um, for us <laughs> to get out there on the pitch and and um, do a few big hits. <laughs> Yeah, you're quite nice people, you know, especially from when I met you in 2014. And speaking of 2014, you are back in Super Rugby and this time at a different team on another continent. You find yourself at the Stormers where you became a quick fan favourite. How did you experience the rugby culture in Cape Town? Man, um, you know, I, I have such fond memories of Cape Town. Um, you know, I, I actually have such good memories that my wife is now from Cape Town. So oh. <laughs> she's, uh, she's a South African. I managed to steal one away from you. And, um, you know, and it's, it's such an amazing place. And I, it has a big part of my life now. So um, the, the memories that I have there, I think they're probably the, 
most enjoyable time that I had as a rugby player in any of my the countries that I've been in. So for me to be out there and, and being a Polynesian as well, I think it's the rugby history is very rich in Cape Town, especially coming out, coming out and, um, you know, they all thought that I was a, I was a Maori, a Maori and, uh, <laughs> they, you know, they, they, they idolized the All Blacks and, you know, any, any Pacific Islander, they, they loved it. And it was, uh, yeah. for me, it was, you know, they really treated me nice and uh, I felt like royalty, you know, and it wasn't like that in, in the UK. And for me to change it up and come to such a, a rugby mad um, country was, was awesome, especially in that part of my career where, you know, you sort of, you sort of got comfortable, as you know, like I was there for a number of seasons in the UK. Um, and as you know, I'm pretty competitive and I wanted to change it up and, and try something different and being, I think I was like 33 at the time and trying to compete at what they say is the fastest competition in the world, um, you know, the rugby. I wanted to see if I could still mix it. And, you know, I did, I tried my best and I managed to start a, a few number of those games in that season. And we, you know, rubbing shoulders with some, some amazing players and, you know, eventual World Cup winners. And uh, I have very good friends now. So from Cape Town and, and family as well. So it is, uh, holds a very special place in my heart. Yeah, I remember, I think it was the match against the Sharks, the Storm was lost. I was actually um, sitting in front there by the first um, 30 seats on the grandstand. And, um, you know, someone was shouting, um, come on, man, do it for the All Blacks. And I'm like, dude, this guy's playing for some <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man, I just remember they, they couldn't really say my name and I just hear them say, Daki, Daki, <laughs> Daki. That's all I do. And I was just so... Yeah, you know, I I just appreciate that they were trying and and they knew who I was and um, you know just for them to to make me feel so welcome in that city and um, you know we, even when we went away that year we played against the Sharks in in uh, Durban and um, that was a tight game we won by a drop goal so that was an amazing experience going there away from home another pretty rugby mad city and um, for us to win it um, in that way was was awesome for not only for the the team, but for the people in Cape Town, so it was awesome. Yeah, I remember I could tell this lot in the last minute. Um, the Sharks should have never lost that game, to be honest, but they kicked the ball away and you guys just kept pouncing and pouncing and then out of nowhere, just slotted it and I'm like, yeah, boys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah <that was> awesome. <laughs> But in any case, um, you then returned to Wasps um, in the Premiership and um, not long after that, um, for a couple of seasons, you announced your retirement in August of 2017. Um, but you would still have one last dance with the Waringa Rats. Um, what prompted your decision to call it today? So, yeah, I, I still had a couple of more seasons left with, um, with Wasps. I, um, I was going through a pretty, pretty tough time and uh, my mother actually found out uh, that she was diagnosed with terminal cancer, uh, lung cancer. So I came back from my sister's wedding and found out that she was pretty bad and, and decided, you know, I've been, been away from home for such a long period of time um, and I'd missed so many years with my family. Um, the, the European season goes, you know, goes into pretty much two years. You start in August and you finish in following May. So it's, a, it's a, such a long time to only spend pretty much a, a month over the last three years every year with your family. And, and that's if I go back to New Zealand. So, you know, it was, it, was, it was a pretty easy decision. I needed to get home and be closer to, to my family and spend, spend that time with, with mum. And, uh, you know, I don't, don't regret that. Um, and then I eventually found a home over here in Sydney, you know, that's, uh, that helped me, you know, after mum passed, um, we, you know, I needed to, needed to kick on with my life. And, um, you know, that, like I said, I've, I've now linked up with my friend here in, um, at Scott's college, uh, Brian Smith, who's now my boss, the old coach, but, um, he, it was, uh, it was easy and the Warringa Northern beaches is such a beautiful place. It actually reminds me a lot of Cape town. It's right on the beach, very coffee, culture and um, there's a few hippies around and uh, the weather's really warm um, so so I think it was the closest thing that I could get to Cape Town was Sydney so um, <laughs> I found myself here yeah. but uh, yeah Ring is, Ring is an awesome club um, they we've got a massive match this weekend uh, a local derby um, local derby is always the best whether it be in Sydney or in Cape Town or you know wherever it is local derbies are, are the ones so we've got a big big match this weekend we've been pre preparing well um 
But, uh, you know, as a coach, it's pretty stressful. I didn't know how much hours you put in um, outside of the footy field uh, as, a, as a coach. So different, different role now, but it's uh, still the same sort of mentality. Now, I see you haven't gotten any grey hair so far, so I think you're doing okay as a coach for now, stress-wise. Oh, so. mate, <laughs> lost the hair, so there's probably grey hair coming. So. so that's why you wear it, hat, eh? <laughs> <laughs> It's hot, it's hot here. <laughs> it's cold out here, actually. We're actually supposed to go into spring, but it's been winter all along. Um, but yeah, oh, in right. any case... It's, uh, yes. it, yeah. is, it is pretty... It's pretty um, warm, warm here at the moment. It was 25 and it's the first, first day of spring. So wow. summers over here are pretty hectic. They get into the 40s sometimes. Yeah, it's pretty much the same here as well, actually. But um, we haven't made that on season as of yet. So we're still waiting on the hot summer days. I'm a summer boy myself. I don't like these windy temperatures. But um, in any case, um, <laughs> so out of all your great memories, Lucy, made during your career, what would you say were your best moments as well as i wouldn't say bad but not so best moments as well um oh, it's a tough one uh i think the the you know i was i was always playing for underdog teams so i've never been part of a, a favorite team as you know like london irish when i joined them they weren't um uh, one of the top four teams they just recently got promoted and i spent a long a long time with that club uh trying to make it to a final. So when we did make it to a final, that was a massive, that was a massive achievement, not only for the club, but for myself to be a part of that. And, um, you know, that we, we lost by one point, but just that whole build up in that season was such amazing. I think it was 2008. Um, and we played, we lost by one point to Leicester at Twickenham. So um, that was a, that was a massive um, achievement um, for me as in professional sport. Um, I think being part of three World Cups was, on a personal note, that was something that I'm very proud of. Um, uh, to I, I wanted, I would have liked to have got to a fourth. I don't think I would have got to a fifth like old um, Brian Lima, but um, that would have been nice to try and push that. Um, but uh, more recently, I think you know coming all the way back to grassroots and playing for playing for Oringa, um it was a massive. You know, even though I wasn't a, on the world stage or anything like that, just to win something. Um, and with everything that went on that year, we, we actually had a tragedy on the field that same year. One of the players um, passed away um, on, the, on, the, on the field. Um, so there was a lot going on. You know, mum was sick. Um, so there was a lot of emotion around that year. And for us to, to, win, to win the shoot shield in that, that year in 2017 was a was something not only for for the people of that area but for myself and uh and and the reasons why we all play rugby is it's, it's for your family and and to enjoy those those massive moments so that was i think that was a very um high point of my career and you know you probably won't hear many ex-professionals say oh club rugby was the best thing ever <laughs> but um for me that was that was just as good as you know that's probably the closest i'll ever get to winning a world cup now <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. But, um, yeah, it's very awesome, you know, like if you have all the experiences and you go around the world, I mean, some players, nothing wrong with it. They stay at one club all their life. And it's great, you know, in terms of royalty. But mm. if you can actually go and, um, like the Sevens Boys, for instance, they play for their country, but they get to see 10 countries in a year. So that's pretty much amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's pretty cool that you had the career that you've had so far. Thank um, you. And, yeah, you're saying? No. Oh, okay, cool. Um, I thought you wanted to say something. And um, I'd just like to touch on this uh, before we wrap this up. So, during your test career, um, Samoa achieved a world ranking as high as seven for a Tier 2 nation. And um, just to put it into a bit of perspective, the Wallabies and the Springboks were at seven as well. So, that, that says a lot. Um, but then they regressed and are currently ranked 15. What do you think might have caused the regression and what do you think needs to be done to get Samoa back to the top 10 or in the top 10 nations again? I was thinking about that and, um, you know, it's something that we always have, uh, a conversation that we always have with uh, my ex-player friends um, and now the current coach, Silala Mapasua uh, of Samoa. He, we, we, we've had those conversations many times and it's a weird one to put your finger on the exact thing that the reason why they've 
they've regressed. But um, I think from from our point of view, from that that year that we achieved seventh, um, there was a lot of older heads in there. We we were we were all well known in the European environment and the European competition. So if you look at that team back in 2011 when we beat Australia, um, we we were all household names in the English Premiership and the top four team. Um, but no one in the Super Rugby knew who we were. Um, <laughs> so we sort of surprised them when we uh, when we played against the Wallabies. But, um, you know, we had Tilava Mapasua, we had um, Tusi PC, you know, we had Khan uh, um, we had uh, so many, Alessandro Tulangi, those, those guys who have been dominating in the European mm-hmm. League for such a long period of time. So, we were sort of like a mature, mature rugby players. I think at the moment they're, they're going through a transition and, you know, it doesn't, we just don't have the depth, especially with the, with the players that we have available and the resources that we have in, in Samoa to develop uh, an academy or something like that to, to give those guys um, more opportunities to grow and develop their skills because there are very skillful um, players there, but, but it's hard to to compete and to learn because they just don't have the, the resources and the facilities to do that and, and, the, and, the, and the coaching. So it is pretty tough. And, you know, there's a few guys that are still all chasing that all black jersey that um, they can chase for a very long time. And it's, it's always it's something that you may not get, something that you might get eventually. But um, that, that as well stops, stops a lot of um, potential Samoans uh, jumping over and, and, and representing their, their – their parents um mm. heritage so it is it is tough i think we i'm looking forward to the new coaching staff um that's going to be involved in preparation for the next world cup um he is a very good friend of mine and he sort of has a a good knowledge of of um how to get you know he has that understanding of the culture and he has an understanding of, of of professional sport um and competing at a high level being a part of um unions in Japan, New Zealand and, and the UK and done very well. So um, I think he'll bring that professionalism as well as balance the cultural aspect of, of Samoa because that's sometimes the hardest thing um, when you're bringing foreign coaches in to coach the national team. They struggle with the, um, the expectations and the, uh, the, the culture because it can be very difficult for people that don't understand. And um, for him being a, you know, being a Samoan and, and having that that knowledge and that experience, I think he can he can really balance that out and and get the best out of the union and get the best out of everyone that's that's gonna that's gonna be part of that that system and that that growth over the next couple of years, hopefully at the next World Cup as well. So um, it's gonna be a hard hard uh, road, but I'm sure with uh, with hard work that, that they'll get there in the end. No, I hope so, man. No. Because Samoa has all the potential in the world. And um, it's just a bit sad to see how they slipped, you know, from basically double the spot they were in a couple of years. Um, and just speaking about academies, I just thought about this now while you spoke about it, you know, um, I think it was on the breakdown a couple of weeks ago, about a month ago. So they had Eddie Jones on. And um, I think Goldie um, asked him about um, something about England and then um, what, what, do you, what does he think about um, the, the depth in New Zealand? And then he said something about, well, they're the three best academies in Samoa, Tonga, and Fiji. So. <laughs> yeah, I saw that. I know, it's terrible. Isn't it? it's, um, it is very, it's, it's very, um, they are fortunate enough that, that is, you know, a lot of Polynesians and Samoans travel over to New Zealand and, and, and live there, and um, they have access to, to those, to those um, talented players. Mm. Definitely, man. And um, just lastly, do you have any advice for any youngster wanting to make the sport of rugby their career? Um, I think it's just, you know, the world's changing. It's uh, changing all the time. And um, with, with everything that's going on, there's, there's uh, a lot that you can do outside of the footy field. You, can, you have to be able to train when no one's looking. Um, that's the thing, to, to, to do the extras, to do... To, you know, to get out there and run on your own, to not wait for someone to to hand you something or give you instructions. Um, you know, the, the the people got there in the end was was, you know, the big names were they they weren't waiting for Tuesday Thursday training. Um, they would go out and train as a professional or professional that professional mentality or mamba mentality was 
they're always working. They're always working hard. And, um, and I think that's the best thing that you can ever, ever do. I, I, I work with a lot of youngsters at the moment and that's what I'm trying to get out of them is for them to, to build that work ethic and, and not just wait for us to give them instructions or, or, you know, for them to go and be proactive and, and do the extras. Um, and that will all pay off. And we can, we as coaches and as, and as selectors and whoever you're trying to impress, um, they'll notice that. Um, you know, you go away one week, you come back and you're faster, or you're stronger, or you've got a better kick. Um, that all comes apart with, with practice and, and getting out there and doing it on your own. So I think that's the main thing for me was, uh, was for the, all these youngsters, the best advice is, is don't wait for anyone and, and do, that, do the work where, where no one can see you. No, definitely. And, you know, it's like the old saying goes, you know, hard work will always be talent any day on the week and twice on a Saturday. So it's always about our hard work. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, man, uh, thanks a lot for your time. I've really enjoyed this chat with you. It's been good catching up again after all these years. Um, I hope you keep well and all the best with your coaching work. I hope you don't lose any more hairs in the process. And oh, you don't get any gray hairs here as well. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you must keep all. Um, and so, yeah, all the best going forward. And um, I'll talk to you soon. Cheers, buddy. Cheers, Angus. Thanks a lot.